Welcome to another episode of Wide Open Throttle. As you can see, we don't have a special guest today. It's just a normal Motor Trend crew. But we do have an episode chock full of supercars, uh, including the all new 911 GT3, which will be part of a special feature at the end of this episode with Walter Roll. So stay tuned for that. Speaking of the GT3, our man Scott Evans is in Germany right now. Uh, and Scott, I hear it's wet out there, but you've had an opportunity to drive the car. Tell us how it is. Yeah, unfortunately the skies opened up on us this afternoon, but we had uh, plenty of dry weather this morning, so we had a good run in it before things got uh, wet out here. But Scott, everyone's talking about the lack of a manual in the new GT3. Tell us, how is the new PDK and does the car need a manual? Well look, I'll tell you what the Porsche guys told me when I asked them that question. They said, we at Porsche enjoy driving manual transmissions as much as anybody, but we also enjoy being the fastest. And that really is the case with this car. Now you can make the argument on a car like the Carrera that it should be more about driving pleasure and you know having a connection with the car and it being fun to drive. But this is the GT3. This is the track car. They say 80% of GT3 buyers take their car to the track. And on the track, you want to be faster. And to be faster, you need the PDK. So would it be fun to have a manual transmission in this car? Yeah, it would, but this is about the fastest lap times, and to do it, you need this thing. And it's a really good, this is even better than the standard PDKs. They've got this thing shifting so fast that if you couldn't hear the engine, you wouldn't even know that it shifted. It's, it's that quick and that smooth. One of the complaints about the new 911 is the fact that it's now got electric power steering. Did you see or feel any problems with that when driving the GT3? We said that a bit about the 911 Carrera because they had really filtered out a lot of the, the road imperfections and the vibrations and things in the name of comfort and everyday drivability, but they put all that back in this car. Now, it's not like an old Porsche where the wheel is just constantly moving in your hands and it's all over the place. It's still filtered a little bit, but you do feel the changes in the road and it will follow the groove sometimes. It, it is a much more honest, more direct steering feel than you get in a standard 911. So Scott, I understand this is the first GT3 to have rear wheel steer. Can you feel that when you're driving? Well, the rear wheel steering only actually turns the rear wheels about up to 1.5 degrees, which is almost nothing, but it has a pretty dramatic effect. Now you don't, it's not like you feel the back end of the car turning around behind you or something, but when you go to turn in for a corner, the turn in is super sharp. The car is even more agile and more nimble than the standard Carrera. And what's really impressive about it is that it holds its line so well. You just pick your apex, point the car at it. It goes perfectly there and perfectly out every single time. It makes you feel like such a better and faster driver. So this thing has uh, a dual clutch. It's got electric power steering. Uh, it's got this rear wheel steer. And I hear it has a ton of computer aids as well. Uh, does this take away at all from the driving experience, Scott? Is it, is it uh, or does it make it better? What do you think? It's true they are using a lot of computers to help make you faster, and they really do work. They really make you feel like a superhero every time you drive this car. And they make anybody faster, anybody who is even a decent driver, but for a, you know, if you're really a full race car driver, the button's right there. You can turn it all off and physics will take over and it'll try and, you know, behave like a 911 behaves. And if you think you're good enough, go for it. But for everybody else who's not a professional race car driver, this thing is absolutely fantastic and they're really not taking anything away from you. Well, Scott, I just gotta say thank you for taking one for the team and driving this car. I know a lot of us really didn't want to do it, so hats off to you. Uh, a lot of people have been lamenting the death of the Metzger engine. What's this new engine like? Well, this thing is pretty amazing. It revs out to 9,000 RPM now, and the noise it makes is just indescribable. It is this just ridiculous wail, and it is so much fun to do it. Uh, the engine has a valve in the intake that opens up at 4,000 RPM and suddenly the power curve goes from a pretty linear thing to just this huge spike and this thing just takes off. It, it absolutely loves being run as hard and as fast as possible at RPM. You could just run it out to 9,000 all day long. So we now have a 9,000 RPM red line. I mean, what's that like? 
You would think a car like the GT3 would be just horrible to drive around town, but they've really got this thing tuned very well that you can cruise around pretty easily, but you get out of town or on a racetrack and it's just phenomenal. It just revs and revs and revs as far as you could go. And every gear, you just, you keep wondering when it's going to shift, but then you realize you've got a couple thousand more RPM before you get there. And it's great because you come out at any corner and you've got all this power to play with before you need to grab the next gear. So it doesn't have to be shifting every couple of seconds. Even though it has short ratios, you can really use the power band because there's so much of it. Yeah, echoing Carlos, thanks again, Scott, for taking this one for the team. Uh, moving on to another supercar, we have our man Art here because you just drove the Aventador Roadster through Montana. Man, Ed, what an experience. I mean, this is the car, of course, that every guy has on his bedroom wall at one point during his life, whether it's the Countach or the Missiolago or now the Aventador. Lamborghini's top model is always the one, isn't it? And, uh, you know, 691 horsepower, seven-speed single-clutch transmission, all-wheel drive, that body is just like nothing else. I mean, driving it through Montana was like driving a UFO. I mean, people do not see Lamborghinis day by day there, and this thing just got attention everywhere it went. Plus, the state is so unbelievable to drive in. The roads are open. You know, it's the, four, it's the fourth largest U.S. state by size, right. but only 44th in population, so it's, it's empty. It's great. I loved it. How's the pavement, though? Is it, is, is, is it well maintained? It depends where you are. In fact, uh, it was a credit to the Lamborghini that often the roads we were on were gravel. And, uh, you know, I'm tiptoeing with this almost $500,000 supercar just wincing, really, because they're working on the roads and we had to cross them to get where we needed to go. But um, uh, when the roads are, uh, the other roads are great. I mean, going to the Sun Road or Beartooth Highway, unbelievable. Beartooth particularly, you're at 10,000 feet, twists and turns and climbs, and the Lamborghini just felt right at home. That's some great. great straights, too, as you found out, right? Yeah, well, uh, <laughs> that was the, the uh, icing on the cake. Yeah. It was at the end, we had the uh, highway uh, department closed down almost four uh, miles of road for me and uh, I got to open up the Aventador as fast as she would go, at least within that distance. And uh, to say we were gunning for 200 miles an hour, you'll have to watch the video to see how fast we got. Uh, the car can go 217 with enough room, but it's a lot of road to get that fast. Hmm. Did you have the top, top down? For that run? Um, I thought about it. Apparently, Lamborghini says that with the top off, the car is just as fast as with the top on. Uh, but because of audio problems, they couldn't hear me talking. They said, put the roof on. So how, much of, how much of the time uh, driving did you have the top off, would you say? I would say at least half the time. I mean, that's one of the great things about where we were in Glacier National Park or in Beartooth Highway. You're, you're looking up at these incredible peaks and having the roof off. And you're in big sky country. I mean, this is, this is Montana. This is what... Um, you know, there's, there's no sky like that. It's and just, not to mention with the roof off, you can hear that engine. You're right. And there was tunnels that I went through on a few occasions, and it's just, <laughs> God, what a sound that thing makes. Unbelievable. Did you find the car uh, nerve-wracking or confidence-inspiring? Because I know at Best Driver's Car a couple years ago, like, it was impressive, but, you know, none of us really loved it for its handling. You know, uh, I can see that it's not a scalpel like the Italia, like the Ferrari, um, but it handled great uh, for me, and I also was surprised at how uh, good the single clutch transmission was. Uh, you know, you're expecting a dual clutch in a, mo in a modern car, this doesn't have it. And I think you had actually done a road test where you were criticizing it for the kind of the startup. Yeah. And I think they've worked out some software on it because it was much smoother in this car. Well, I went to the launch in, uh, in Homestead, we drove around the track, and you know, on a racetrack at, at full throttle and race in what, Strata, and, and, and sort of Corsa, Corsa yeah. uh, it's, it's phenomenal, it's very emotional, right, as mm. I like to say. Is it still punchy in the back of the it head? It does. Oh my god, like a sledgehammer. Yeah, yeah. so which, which is fun, um, well, but, you know, maybe twice. on the track, <laughs> it's, it's, if you're into that. Yeah, if you're into that. <laughs> It's fun on the track, but yeah, around around town it's a little much. I think the big thing is, because you were mostly solo, right? Yes. My problem is always when you're driving the, the, the single clutches, and this is what's true, what's true with the R8, the person next to you, your date, your companion, they're not, they don't know when the shifts are coming, so you see their head do this. Yeah. You know, and that's the problem, because for a driver, you know when the shift is coming, you're probably inducing it with the paddle. Right. The other person is like, get me out of this thing, because it's like a bucking. Yeah, I never, I always ran it in manual mode. I always shifted for myself, because I just like, you know, having that control. Um, but yeah, like I said, it was it was sweet to me. And the other thing was impressive was we put a lot of miles on this particular test car, I mean, 1,500 miles or so, and in yeah. some pretty rough conditions, the gravel roads, lots of altitude, drove it very fast, repeatedly, uh, lots of braking. 
Car was absolutely fine. Started up, trundled through towns with no problem, drove fast with no problem. Um, you know, I was always very concerned about the tires, obviously, but uh, the Pirellis were great too. How, how was the fuel economy? <laughs> I think it was about three. Who cares? Uh, <laughs> when you when you roll into town and you just feel like a rock star. Yeah, it's it's incredible the reception it got. Yeah. And although a few people came up to me in some small uh, Montana towns and said, you know, there's a couple other Lamborghinis here. Oh really? There's, there's tra the tractors. We love no, there is <laughs> Montana. There's some money there. Yeah. yeah. They got the Yellowstone Club and people go up there. They they have their second or third homes. There's a ranch up there. So there are a few Aventadors stashed away, but still this thing was the star wherever it went. So what were you telling people, uh, wh what was your cover story? James Bond? Uh, I'm not the, telling the, you, the you, have to watch the, you have to watch the video. <laughs> the Underwood account? <laughs> uh, well, great. So let's move off of Raging Bulls and get into Super Snakes. Uh, we just had the Shelby GT500 Super Snake. Uh, pretty controversial ignition you did there, Carlos. Tell us about it. Well, it's, an, it's a pretty polarizing car. Um, on numbers alone, it's incredible. 850 horsepower Super Snake. So you've got about 200 horsepower more than the standard GT500. I mean, that's insane. It costs just under $100,000, and it makes a sound and acceleration that is just difficult to believe that it's happening, especially when you're driving it. And that it's bolted to a Mustang chassis, which, you know, was developed back in, what, 91? That. <laughs> But there are some interesting things that happen when you go full throttle in that car. Um, yeah. yeah. Can it put the power down at all? Not in first gear. Not in second not, gear. <laughs> not so much in second gear, but when you're in third and fourth gear, the acceleration is absolutely insane. Can it's, you spin in fourth? If you, yeah, I mean, you can pump the clutch and do that, but it's, it's got good, pretty good traction in fourth gear. It's got a, a fairly aggressive tire on it, but the problem with launching it, especially at a drag strip or like the way we test when we don't have VHT is the launch is hard. You know, you basically get out of first as quick as possible, ride through second, and then you know wait for the acceleration in third and fourth. Mm -hmm. um, we've got, or I got a 12 flat at about 130, and there's a lot more left in it. That thing can do high 11s. Um, one of our sister publications, I believe, on VHT, got it into the 10 second range. So it's Good Lord. a very, very, very fast car. Well, by the trap speed, you can tell. It's all based on uh, the launch is terrible, yeah. and then it's just pulling like crazy at the end. I remember the first time I got into the boost at like third or fourth gear, I got out and my hands were like, <laughs> you know, like just shaking. Uh, you know, we dynoed it at k and and it put down uh, fairly accurate numbers. I think figuring in the drivetrain loss, it was right at advertised 850 horsepower. Really? And this is a turnkey, mm -hmm. you know, you don't have to worry about cooling, you don't have to worry about plugging a computer in and checking it out every morning. It's, and it's based on the, the current most powerful production car sold yes. in America. Yes. So yes. This has got to be the most powerful American car ever sold? Well, it depends on how you want to classify it because, you know, it, it's a tuner. It's mm -hmm. an aftermarket company. They're not going through EPA crash testing or all that stuff. They're putting a really big blower on this yeah, 5.8 right. and it works well. Uh, unfortunately, we did have an issue <laughs> during testing. You get horsepower like that, you do need to get it woed down. And so what, what happened there, Carl? Yeah, so uh, we do acceleration runs and brake runs simultaneously going back and forth, which is pretty advanced wear on brakes, but you know, most production cars, all production cars take it pretty well. On the fifth, fifth acceleration run, you go past the quarter, uh, and I get on the brake pedal, and the da data shows, you know, I begin slowing at about 140, and the brake pedal just goes <laughs> all the way to the floor. And I just go, oh, this is, <laughs> this is gonna be interesting. So, okay, so back up here, Carlos. You, you're, you're in fifth gear? You're in s 140, I think that was fourth, fourth gear. Fourth yeah, gear, gear, fourth gear, yeah. 140, mm -hmm. and then you start, you start braking. Yeah. Now you're obviously here, so it didn't, <laughs> it didn't go terribly yeah. long. Yeah, uh, it didn't go bad. Fortunately, there's a lot of runoff where we test and I'm on the brake all the way to the, all the, way to the, uh, the pedal, and I'm downshifting really aggressively to slow the car down. Yeah. I want to try the e-brake because at that part you in the could, runoff, it gets yeah. kind of slippery. Uh, and then as soon as the speed slows down to about 60, because the car's still decelerating, just not at an ideal rate, right. uh, I can hear the ABS grabbing in the front wheels. So the car was stopping. And looking at the data, I mean, it wasn't that bad um, of an issue, but you know, still not ideal. So the car did come to a complete Break stop. Brake pedal to the floor at 140. I call that an issue. Yeah, those are fun. Wait, you had the pedal to the floor and you're downshifting and not crapping yourself? You don't have time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's a second when you acknowledge so that like, <laughs> there's a second when you acknowledge like, oh wow, things have gone really bad here. 
and then you can you know worry about it, but then you actually have to start doing stuff. You Code know? Brown. You, you have <laughs> gone through something similar with another Ford product. You don't really think about it till after the fact. Yeah. When you sit there and after you've gotten out of the car and you're like, wow, that could have been really bad, <laughs> you know, so. But the important thing to note is that uh, I think what happened, it's tough to always estimate what happened with the brakes, but it looked like what happened is the pads got too hot. Maybe they were aggressively worn before they came to us and they didn't get swapped. Uh, it looks like the pads got too hot and started just chunking to pieces and scored the rotors pretty bad. The car was still drivable. I mean, I drove it home after that and it did stop okay. Uh, but you know, 140 mile an hour brakes, right. not too well, great. Well, <laughs> we're glad that you're able to save the situation yeah. in here and to, to live another day and do some more ignitions for us. <laughs> and on that note, uh, that's it for this week's episode of Wide and Throttle. But stay tuned right now for a special feature uh, with Walter Roll and the all new Porsche 911 GT3. Thanks for watching. <laughs> I always say, if something had happened, an accident, he has to, stern, to, to steer it off the road, otherwise yeah. it doesn't happen. That is. <laughs> mm -hmm. On beginning, uh, I have done a, a, a lap uh, with the 997 and said, okay, the car is perfect. Then I was sitting in this car, I said, yeah, I think it's a little bit easier to drive. Then I watch, I watch my, my 15 seconds faster. I can't believe it. The difference to the normal 911, all things are even more precise than on a normal car because you have a, a, a harder car, which means you get more uh, turning in. It's 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 even more quickly than in a normal car, then the traction, that is one which is the biggest advantage against other sport cars. We have so fantastic traction that you always can put down all powers which you have on ground, even if it's raining. That is unbelievable how much power we can really transmit on, on the road. And uh, for me, it's one thing is also important, especially uh, if I am on, on a racetrack. I can do it for 20, for 30 laps, and the car stays in the same condition. And all the other cars losing uh, performance during driving a long time. The best thing is, of course, if you are really, really very gentle with the steering. That is. And I think that is the only secret of fast car driving is use your steering as less as possible. That is absolutely, and especially with 911, you only have to take care that the entry of the corner is the slowest point, and from this point you start accelerating. Then you are absolutely on the fast, sure line. Yeah, that will be not so easy because every time I sit in the car, I said, now we have reached the limit. But what you should be better on this car. But for sure, they will find some power. They will increase even more downforce. And that, that's happened. The rest is, is so perfectly on this car. 
and it will be a, another step in direction of ISCA. If I have to compare this car to any type of Porsche, it's like it was a 73 2.7 liter RS. It's like this. And uh, privately, I have a 964 RS, which is a nice car from 1991, uh, without any electronic help, no ABS, nothing, which, which is something it's real car driving, you know, it's up to me to go fast. And here, I cannot say I'm a good driver, I, I only can say it's a good car. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I look. Yeah. Hello. Hello.